we dive into this, what I want to do is I'd like to just, you know, in one hour, it's difficult to, to give a, you know, exactly how to, but what I want to do is show you what's possible, what you can achieve with lasers and, and nodonics. And um, we'll talk about the multifunctionality of the use of the laser um, in, in different aspects and, and how that relates to the ROI, but, but mainly we'll focus on endodontics. So let's dive in here. And if you have any questions, just um, again, as David said, go to the Q&A or the chat button and type them in there and we'll address them at the end. A few couple disclaimers, anything that I say in here, it's my opinion. Um, does it have any uh, bio ladies, does not back this or anything, but it's my opinion only. As David said, I'm a diplomat of the American Board of Endodontics. I did receive a fee for preparing the content and speaking, and I do not maintain any financial interest in any product shown in today's lecture. So I'd like to start off with a little introduction, a little background. So in 2011, along with a key group of other endodontists, we got together, we met, we talked about the problems that we were facing in endodontics. And one of the main problems that we were facing was uh, vertical root fractures, cracked teeth, and that was due to an over preparation, large accesses, large shaping. So we got together in 2011, we discussed this, we talked about nomenclature, we talked about what we could do moving forward to help this. And I think that um, now minimally invasive endodontics is now mainstream. And we're gonna see why that's important uh, moving forward here. I am the developer and patented dynamically guided endodontic treatment. And I'm currently working with BioLase, assisting them in refining their protocol for laser activated disinfection. Today's outline, we're gonna look at minimally invasive endodontics and modalities of failure for endodontically treated teeth. We'll briefly look at tooth, tooth anatomy. We'll look at current endodontic irrigation devices. We'll touch on those. We'll discuss uh, pros and cons of each of those. We'll briefly look at the uh, laser literature, define uh, what laser energy is, applications to dentistry, and again, a uh, brief focus on endodontics. And then we'll dive into some case reviews and I'll show you what's possible with the laser. We'll finish that up with any concluding comments or questions. So as we look at this, why do endodontically treated teeth fail? Again, that's, this goes back to 2010, 2011 when we got together and discuss this, but this was 73 teeth were extracted during a 10 year period. And they found that 58% of these extractions were related to root fractures and caries. These were the main reasons. Contrary to, to what uh, many endodontists think, it's, you know, it didn't shape right, um, didn't, didn't access right. It, it's mainly our, due to our over shaping, over access is leading to these root fractures. 10 year retrospective study on 411 patients they had 68 teeth were reported to be extracted, and of those, 30% of them were due to tooth fruit fractures. Again, why do endodontically treated teeth fail? We looked at the contribution of root canal treatment to the fracture resistance in dentin. And what they concluded in this paper was there's a decrease in the strength of radicular dentin in teeth that have received endodontic treatment followed by clinical function. And this degradation exceeds that which results from the natural aging process over time. Dr. Krishan looked at um, impacts of the conservative endodontic cavity on instrumentation and uh, versus the traditional. And what, what is of importance here is that the instrumentation is compromised in distal canals of lower molars with more than 60% of the canal wall left untouched in the conservative endodontic cavity. So I think that's really important. What he also concluded was that the conservative cavity resulted in less dentin removal. So we have a trade-off. We um, basically conserve more tooth structure, which helps with the strength, but we failed to instrument more than 60% of the canal wall. Now the fracture resistance in molars and premolars with the conservative cavity is 2.5 and 1.8 fold more than the match uh, controls with the traditional cavity. So we address one problem there. If we look at some uh, surgical treatments of when we do apicose and why we resect three millimeters or more in endodontics, what we find is that with one millimeter resection, we address 52% of apical ramifications. With two millimeters, 78%. 
and with three millimeters, 98%. Most of the failures, if it's not structural, will be related to this apical anatomy. And that's the reason why we do that in endodontics, but we resect three or more is due to this uh, apical ramifications, the lateral canals in the apical third of the tooth. And that's where the laser is going to come into play. So three millimeters of the root end must be removed to reduce 98% of apical ramifications and 93% of lateral canals. This is a photo um, credit of Dr. Craig Barrington. I just want to show it to show the anatomy that we're having to address when we treat a tooth endodontically. Very complex anatomy. And so, yes, the anatomy matters. I'd like to share a case here now. So, again, why do endodontically treated teeth fail? This was a 29-year-old that I saw just a few weeks ago. She presented to my office. She had had this tooth treated, and then she had had it retreated again by an endodontist. She came to me for a second opinion. This tooth was advised to have this tooth removed. We looked at the tooth here. We looked, there's a apical finding present on the mesial root. We look at the uh, coronal slice on the CT. We see a really broad isthmus between the two. So this is the tooth that should be retreated. We retreated this tooth, located the mid mesial canal, laser treatment, irrigation performed for um, laser assisted debridement of the canals. You can see all the apical ramifications present lateral canal and the distal as well. So again, anatomy matters when we're treating teeth. Post-op cone beam, you can see the mid-mesial present there and multiple portals of exit as well. I treated this tooth in about 2015. Started becoming really uh, minimally invasive in the approach, minimal access, minimal shaping, 15, 20, 04 shaping. When this patient returned, I think we've all had this in, in endo, as they return, they tap on their tooth with their finger and they say, my tooth hurts. And that's what happened here. This patient returned, said, my tooth hurts, tapped on it. I confirmed that it did. I discussed it with him, showed him the x-ray, said, everything looks great on him. We took a post-op CT. Everything looked good. No anatomy was untreated. And discussed all of that with him, told him we filled to the length exactly like we're taught. The patient's response was, I don't care, fix it. So that kind of started the wheels in motion for me. You know, did everything that I thought I was, was right, you know, conserving tooth structure, minimize fracture. So I, I traded off on one thing and compromised the other. So what can we do to address that? Traditional endodontics. So what I did, I went back and looked at the, um, you know, what we did in traditional endo. Well, the first paper I looked at is we could open the apex up larger. We can enlarge our canals to reduce more intracanal bacteria. Well, we'd had the problem with fractures, so I know that was not an option. Next thing I looked at is we can place the intracanal dressing, such as calcium hydroxide in a tooth. This is shown to help, and I've done this for many years as well, but um, most people, most patients, they like the single visit approach. They don't like to come back multiple times. So I ruled that one out. The other thing that you can do is uh, tissue dissolution by sodium hypochlorite. You can heat it, um, increase the concentration. You can leave it in longer. You can let the patient um, sit in your chair for an hour or two to, to soak and, and changing it out. But again, most of the time, patients don't want to sit there. Um, with their mouth open for two hours during treatment. So that was out as well. So I began to look at other options. Now the needle irrigation, as we look at these, has a very long successful track record in endodontics, shown to be safe. We can use it in minimally invasive endodontics. I can use it in dynamically guided endodontics. And if you, don't, if you aren't familiar with dynamically guided endodontics, you can look that up on the internet. There's a few papers on it that's out there, and, and you can see why it's important um, to be able to use the device of irrigation with dynamically guided endodontics. And there's no disruption of your procedural flow. It's single use. It's affordable. You can use it on multiple teeth. Uh, but is there a better option? And again, after that case, I started, you know, trying to figure out, get a couple back that their tooth hurts. I want to do something better. I want a better option. So that's out. So next I looked at uh, two different options, the water laser, I plus, the laser, and the gentle wave. And I made a list out, pros and cons, water laser. 
there's no evidence of really improved outcomes um, yet. It is safe. You can use it for minimally invasive endodontics, dynamically guided endodontics. There's zero disruption of procedural flow. It's multifunctional. By multifunctional, I mean you can use it for endodontic treatment, you can use it for perio treatment, gingivectomies, soft tissue, hard tissue, um, many, many different uh, modalities that you can use it on. Cost of the unit is approximately, um, of each tip is approximately 10 to $20. You can use it on multiple teeth. And it works by uh, fluid dynamics. So light seeks, uh, light creates shock waves, seeks out water, and uh, that's how it works. The gentle wave, no evidence of improved outcome. Uh, questionable on safety, there have been reported so sodium hypochlorite accidents reported. Uh, I've heard of an aspiration pneumonia, ulcerations, um, multiple having to stop um, the cycle short, so you're not getting the full cycle benefit. Um, and we know that to dissolve tissue, you need the hypochlorite in there for the full cycle. It does require a three millimeter minimum access size. So um, its effect on minimally invasive endodontics, it kind of compromises that. You cannot use it for dynamically guided endodontics without procedural flow. Disruptive on procedural flow requires the uh, building of a platform and a, a leak test. If there's any leak, then you have to start over. Single use, cannot use it on more than one tooth at a time, only one tooth. The per use fee of about $60, and um, it does work great. Fluid dynamics, there's some in vitro work that shows very, very um, clean teeth, SEM work on that. But for me, what fit into my practice, what fit into my flow was the laser. It's safe. I can use it for minimally invasive endo. It does not affect my procedural flow. It's multifunctional, so the ROI is there. And we're working on improved outcomes. Here's a recent study, and what they looked at was the evaluation of the bacterial cytal component of the YSGG, the water lase, and a diode laser. And they had 52 caries-free premolars divided into six groups. They had a saline only with needle irrigation. They had an EDTA and hypo with needle irrigation. They had the laser, the YSGG with saline, the YSGG with saline and a disinfection, and the YSGG with saline followed by use of the diode. And what they concluded was the combination of the YSGG and the diode laser is safe and is comparable to needle irrigation using EDTA on the removal of epicalis. And you know, at first glance, and I, and I visited with them on the study was, well, that doesn't, you know, why would I use the laser instead of just doing traditional needle irrigation? But you look into a little more, and the laser was only using saline during this study only. And its results were comparable to bleach and EDTA. The control group, the group one, which was saline, uh, saline needle irrigation, resulted in zero removal of the efecalis within the root canal system. So I think it's a, a pretty powerful study. Now, if you're gonna use the laser and incorporate it, the, the steps are, I do not do the access with the laser, um, but you're gonna access the tooth conventional method, you're gonna do your cleaning and shaping. And then once the canal is clean and shaped, you're gonna introduce the laser to the canal terminus, one mil minus one millimeter short, and then you'll activate it on the way out. These are the two main tips that are used for endodontic treatment, the RFT2, which has an outer diameter of 0.27 millimeters, and the RFT3, which is an outer diameter of 0.37 millimeters. The tip that I use exclusively is the RFT2, and with the outer diameter of 0.27 millimeters, finishing with a 2004 file that gets your tip to about one millimeter of working length. The other tip I use frequently is the MZ6. This is used for soft tissues, gingivectomies. And the last tip that I use is the RFTP14. This is used for perio treatment, perio window lesions, sinus tracts. Um, I'm doing a combination of disinfection in the canal with the RFT2 followed by the RFTP14. On these cases that have these combined perio endo, treating them in a single visit with that. And lastly, the MZ10 is porcelain crown removal. So the um, water laser is the only laser that is FDA approved for porcelain crown removals. 
So let's look at this video animation here um, created by water lays for root canal cleaning and disinfection. And it'll kind of show the steps. So we have the tooth access. We've done our cleaning and shaping um, with the traditional approach. We've determined working length. Then what we want to do is we're going to come in here and we're going to introduce the laser into the canals. And you're going to have hypochlorite in the canal at the time. And you're gonna introduce it one millimeter short and the laser is not activated until you reach your working length minus one. You're gonna make sure that the laser tip does not bind in the canal. Now these laser tips, it's important to know, these are not in firing. These are all radial firing laser tips. Why is that important? It's important for two reasons. The in firing ones will create a ledge inside the canal. And then you're also not hitting the lateral canals in the tooth. So the radial firing tips uh, help minimize the, the um, chance of ledging in there, as well as that radial activation, that firing is getting the lateral canals on the way out. So you're gonna go down into each canal, and I typically go down to each canal three times, and I'm activating it. It takes about 10, 15 seconds to um, remove the tip, and you're replacing and replenishing with hypochlorite as you go. And we'll see a video here how I do that in a little bit. So endodontic irrigation, why is it important? This is a, a little in vitro um, block that Dr. Steve Buchanan, a good, good friend, created. And they've done some tests on this with other devices. And what that is, is it's a piece of prosciutto, a piece of, piece of ham in there simulating the pulp. And I've used the laser for a bit and, and you know, it looks good, but I want to know exactly what is going on inside the tooth. So, he helped create this device that way we can see, you know, what's going on inside the tooth. And we're going to look at that here. I'll show you a video here uh, towards the end of the lecture, and we'll see if the laser really works or not. So let's dive into some case reviews here. We've got this patient presented. She had a necrotic tooth, deep caries on the distal, apical finding going on. She presented a lot of pain. Now, this is a Double curve here, S-shaped curve on the mesial and a little dilaceration on the distal. This is a pretty challenging tooth. Traditionally, this would be a case I would do in uh, two visits. Uh, number one, just handling the curvatures in there can be very difficult, but with the uh, necrotic and the finding, I was not comfortable in treating these in one. But we treated this in a single visit. Um, we did laser-assisted disinfection inside the canals. You can see the multiple portals of exit that were filled, the lateral canals on the uh, mesial root. And we sealed it to its full terminus. You can see we got the little curves on both the uh, very apical anatomy and the mesial and the distal roots. And we have a pre-op and a this is a four-month follow-up uh, CT. And you can notice the healing that's going on. I can't point it out here with my mouse, but we've got healing going on there on the distal root. Quite a bit of bone fill going in. Again, I'm pretty pr impressed with this healing. I did not routinely take, you know, four month follow up CTs on my cases, but um, the, the cases that I did, I did not see the bone filling in this fast with the uh, traditional approach. Let's look at this number 14, necrotic number 14, <clears throat> presented with findings on MB, large finding on the palatal. We'll look at a CT here in a minute and I'll point it out and on the distal. And you can notice the very minimally invasive access that was performed on this tooth here. You know, it's got a crown on it, so you could open that up if you'd like, but most patients really appreciate the uh, minimally invasive approach. You can see the, the minimal instrumentation that was performed on all the roots, particularly the MB. We're gonna look at that on the cross section. I'm gonna show you what the laser did here. That's, that's very important. But if you look at the palatal finding here on the CT, You'll notice how large that periapical finding is. In the past, for me, these are very problematic to get to heal. And you'll notice the post-op, six-month post-op CT here, complete resolution of the finding on the palatal root. Pretty impressive. What's even more impressive here is the MB here to me. I located the MB1 canal. Didn't I locate the MB2 canal in this case? You'll see the, on the uh, pre-op CT on the left. At the apical area, the bone is completely gone. We've got a fenestration there. On the right, the bone is regenerated. But what we'll also notice is about mid-root, there's a branch of the MB2. And the laser cleaned that out through fluid dynamics, cavitation bubbles, cleaned that out, 
We have sealer in there. We have healing going on on that MB root as well. It's pretty impressive. Tooth number 30, extensive decay going on here. Um, remove the bridge, located all the anatomy in there, very minimally invasive shaping. So typically I'm doing anywhere from a 15 to a 2004 now on uh, most of my canals. Then we're hitting that with the laser and we're still seeing lots of anatomy, but the impressive thing is the healing that's going on. Three month follow-up CT, pretty impressive bone re regeneration that's occurring here. Still doesn't have a restored with the bridge yet, but hopefully he will soon. Coronal slices, we've got the mesial root on the left, the distal root on the right, and we see the bone regeneration, the buccal bone that's regenerated on the distal root. Pretty impressive. This patient here presented, he had trauma when he was younger. Pretty significant findings on the lateral aspects of the root. I was, you know, gave him pretty guarded prognosis going in on this case here. No, I did not treat this case in a single visit. We treated this case, I believe I saw him over three appointments. I wanted to be a little more confident that we had resolution going on. And I completed one I, once I had bony um, healing. It was over about a six month time period from start to finish. But notice the, uh, Canal anatomy filled, filled that lateral lesion, um, the lateral canal, so the lateral lesion up. We've got great osseous regeneration going on on a case that I was questionable going into. Post op, pre op and post op CTs showing osseous regeneration, um, pretty substantial healing going on in a short amount of time. And uh, another slice there. So, pre op slice, you can see that there's basically no lingual or buccal bone present on the CT and on the post-op CT we have a, a you know thin layer bone that's regenerated over the, over the end of the root there. As we dive in look at this uh, the C-shaped cases are, are very problematic. This patient here presented tooth number 31 it's a C-shaped case it had deep probing defects you had the hypertrophic tissue growing you know that, that presents with the when these uh, C shapes go necrotic, and <clears throat> these the anatomy on these are very very complicated teeth. Pre op CT here, and I treated this about two months ago, so I don't have a, a uh, healing case yet. But I want to show you the anatomy that we have present here. Went in there, treated this in a single visit. I signed back for a week check later. The hypertrophic tissue sinus tract there at the sulcus was completely healed. We treated this. Through traditional endodontics, laser assisted um, canal debridement, and then we used that perio tip, the RFTP14, and that went down the buccal and distal of the tooth to debride that sulcus. So it's the uh, repair protocol that we followed for the perio aspects of this. Another C shape, number 31, this was an irreversible pulpitis case, and these. Um, C-shaped irreversible pulpitis, they're just full of tissue. They've got a huge uh, ring in between them. And we see that just the, how these canals all merge together apically and then split apart. And to get that debridement um, from the laser, you're, you're not gonna get that from traditional needle irrigation alone. So um, one of the things I will point out is that I typically, after treating these, the, the post-op symptoms are significantly less than traditional treatment. Um, there, there's something in that laser activation that's, that's helping remove some of that inflammatory inflammation, some of the inflammatory mediators going on. So I've seen a significant decrease in post-op discomfort. Another C-shaped here, I'd like to show the complexity of these that's going on. This is a necrotic case, very minimally invasive access. So, I mean, you can make your access, you could open it up a little more if you'd like, but there's really no need to do that with the laser. Um, all you need is the, the angulation to slide the uh, laser fiber in there, and then you kind of let it do its work there. Straightforward number four, and this is the multifunctionality use of the laser. You've got tooth number four with deep distal decay, and you've got the, the gingiva tissue that's grown into the tooth. And traditionally, it's you clean this out. And you kind of have a lot of heme coming in, a little blood from that hypertrophic tissue. Then you've got to create a pre-endo buildup, put a matrix there. You know, with the laser, no longer do you have to do that. You access, you clean it up, perform a gingivectomy with the MZ6 tip. 
You have a very clean site, no need to put any matrices down. Like I said, it does not disrupt any of your procedural flow. And you can perform, complete your endodontic treatment. After you obturate, then you put a, a matrix barrier down, a bioclear matrix or matrix of your choice, and you restore the tooth, clean it up, restore the case. This is an interesting case here, and this kind of goes into the uh, dynamic navigation that we talked about earlier, but this was a uh, three-rooted lower uh, number 30 erratics, and this patient um, had been told to remove this tooth that um, couldn't be saved. Um, but we went in there, and I, I felt pretty confident that we could treat it. No fractures present, very conservative endodontic access performed there. So we call this a dual access, dual access approach. And again, the only way that you can disinfect the dual access approach with the, the devices out there would be traditional needle irrigation um, or the laser um, or, or some other device like the endo activator, which um, haven't, haven't looked at much into that. But you'll see we have a dual access canal treated to their terminus. We've got multiple uh, portals of exit field. We've got a mid root lateral canal. And this is a three month follow up. So case was treated and she came in with an acute apical abscess. So the first visit we opened the tooth up and um, then she came back a week later once the abscess was down, once her swelling was down, completed the case and restored it. And then she came back for a three month follow up and I mean, we've got great resolution. Let's look at the post op, pre op and post op CTs. Notice all the, the bone breakdown, the osteos. Um, loss of bone in the furcation, huge area filling that furcal canal, allowed that bone to regenerate. We've got great regeneration going on on the um, apical portion of the distal root as well as on the apical portion of the mesial root. So just fantastic healing, patient ecstatic that we were able to save this tooth. You know, if she loses this tooth, she loses all her posterior support on that uh, right side. So this is a pretty key tooth for this patient here. Um, very important one to save for her. A few more uh, CT comparisons. Got the uh, pre-op mesa root first image, post-op mesa root, and then we've got the um, radix, the distal buckle and distal lingual root showing there with the regeneration going on. You can see the regeneration, the apical portion on the DB of the uh, buckle bone going on. Look at this, number 30 came in and he had a slight crack going on, opened it up, we fluted out the crack. We saw that the crack does not enter the canal system. So if it does not travel down the, down the roots, you should have a good uh, prognosis. But these cracked teeth, we wanna be very careful that we're not over-instrumenting, over-accessing them. So pretty long roots on this case here, so you can see how conservative we were in our instrumentation. And that 20 um, laser tip, our FT2, it's a 20, just slides down. And we've got multiple, again, multiple anatomy, um, sealed. And if you remember that that literature that we looked at earlier, the surgery literature, the reason we resect three millimeters is because that's where over 90% of the apical ramifications are. So that's why it's important with this laser, the la the bio laser. It's one of the only. It is the only laser that you can slide the laser tip down to the terminus and actually um, get the energy down in that apical portion. So there's other ones out there that you just hold it inside the chamber. This one, you can do both. You can go down all the way in the canal or in the chamber. So it's got the multifunctionality of that. I think it's really important that you get it down close to the um, apex as well to activate and disinfect that area. Little um, zoomed in portion, we've got a couple of canals filled on the distal and the mesial root. You'll see um, several little branches coming off as well. Tooth number three, pretty significant uh, palatal finding. We're gonna see that on the CT here. Um, necrotic tooth, again, just very, very minimally invasive access before maybe two millimeters um, in diameter there. So uh, very conservative approach. And, you know, I think this begs the question then is, is restorative. How should we approach this restoratively? And I think that's something that we need, need to address is, Traditionally, we've recommended crowns on all posterior teeth after endodontic treatment, and the literature has supported that, but that was looking at the traditional endodontic access. So I think this is something that should be looked at in the future. Very conservative shaping as well. Pre-op image on the left, four-month follow-up image on the right, showing the healing, and I want you to look at the uh, palatal root on this one. 
the palatal root, she had a palatal sinus tract going on. You can see the loss of the um, palatal bone there in the apical portion. And this area here is, those are always problematic. When I see the palatal sinus tract, typically those can, can be stubborn teeth and, and sometimes you end up having to remove those. But we incorporated laser treated this single approach and we've got great healing going on there. Let's look at a little in vitro here study. This is a um, little replica, again, printed by uh, Dr. Buchanan. And we're gonna look at kind of the laser, the cavitation that goes on, the fluid dynamics in using the laser here. So we're looking at the uh, MB root. So this is the uh, MB root. We've got the, it's in the MB2 right now, the, the fibers in the MB2, and we're gonna activate it. And you're gonna see the fluid dynamics occurring as we withdraw the laser tip. And there's a, there's a little anastomosis between the MB1 and the MB2 there. And if you look close, you'll start seeing some of these cavitation bubbles that are gonna cross over and go. So you know it's cleaning out that little isthmuses, the anastomosis between the canals there. And you can just see the activation going on. We'll drop it over into the MB1 here now. Look at that. This is a 27 millimeter long monster here. This was the physician I saw and presented symptomatic carotid tooth, just a just long, long roots on this long curvy roots. You can see the uh, excess cementum um, deposition on the, both the mesial and the distal roots. Those are very hard to gain patency on um, when you have that excess kind of bulbous roots form. So we spent a lot of time on this case, treated this single visit activated this like crazy and I was never able to get patent on the uh, mesial root with uh, my apex locator never could get a defined reading and if you look at the post-op you'll see why that takes a 90 degree turn but using activating that with the laser we got it cleaned out notice the apical let's zoom in notice uh on the distal comes into one and then it kind of bifurcates into a kind of a fork there in the apical portion as well Again, I know all that cleaning was done. It was not done by me by instrumentation. It was done by uh, fluid dynamics from the laser. This was a case I treated prior to having the laser. So this was the uh, pre-op as he came into my office, came in, pretty significant finding there on the mesial root. So we retreated this case as I always do any retreatment before in a single, in two visits, Cleaned it out, placed calcium hydroxide, left that for a month, had him back, completed the case. Doing okay. Patient returned about three months later. Image on the left there shown, and the finding had gotten bigger. And he was he had some swelling going on, was having some pain. And so I did this in 2018, and that's when I started using the laser. And, and so I had the laser for a few months. So I retreated this case image on the right in a single visit, just the um, mesial root, we treated it in a single visit. The only thing different that I did between this time and the first time was I redid this in a single visit and I used the laser. I did not use any calcium hydroxide, um, but that's the only difference. Everything else stayed the same. And he came back uh, six months later and there's the healing going on. Never had any problems after that retreatment with the laser. So that was, um, pretty substantial finding for me when I did that. And, and you know, at that time, that was a few months in with the laser and that we would give it a try. And, and that was, like I said, only thing different was incorporating the laser in there. So I know it's doing something. Anterior case, typically before um, anterior cases, I rarely saw any anatomy present. Now I see anatomy present more often than not. And just by incorporating the laser there. So just kind of a neat case to show out there. You know, most of the time it's just prior to this, just a single cone in there, but we've got multiple portals of exit being um, filled there, incorporating the laser into your case. Um, tooth number 20 I treated with endo using the laser, pretty straightforward case. And then she came back and needed number 19 treated. And I thought this was a pretty cool post-op x-ray. I don't have a follow-up on 19 yet, but just the anastomosis, the webbing, and this corresponds with that um, in vitro that, that we just looked at with the cavitation, the fluid dynamics going on, just cleaning out everything. So lots of webbing going on there on the mesial root. And then um, this was 
a four month follow up there of the number 20 we had from the uh, treatment there. So you can see healing going on there in that case. Kind of as we wrap up some of this case reviews here and then get in some questions, um, I'd like to look at a few more. Very uh, number 18, curved, curved canals. And one of the things that I want to point out here, if we look at the cross section on the um, CT, the apical finding is confluent with the mandibular nerve. And with the other devices that create some pressure there, this can be um, a contraindication to its use. And so, you know, you can't use it on every case on the other devices with the laser. There's no contraindications. Near the sinus, you can use it. Near the uh, mandibular nerve, you can use it. No problem. Completely safe. So um, just want to point that out there. Now, one of the things that you need to be cautious of on this case is the obturation. That's where you can get into problems in cases like this because the laser is going to clean out to the end and you're going to have a very patent opening there. So cases like this after laser use, I'll, I'll mix my sealer a little thicker on this case here. But you can see very, very conservative access, um, mesialized access. We're coming just through the existing restoration. Single visit treatment canals sealed to the apical terminus with multiple ramifications. Um, and like I said, mixed my seed are a little thick, thicker. We got just a puff right where we want it, very end of the root, and sent that out. And we talked about the uh, multifunctionality use of the laser. This is a eight or nine year old boy I saw, and I cannot get him get them to come back in for a follow up. So I assume he's doing well. But came in following trauma. You can see he's got a little exposure there in the pulp. And typically before what I would do is would go in here and numb him up and um, perform a gingivectomy, probably have a lot of bleeding from the gingivectomy and go in there, use my burr then, remove the pulp, have some bleeding from that, put a hypochlorite pellet to try to control it, hopefully pack some MTA or something and then restore. Well, using the laser on an eight-year-old, uh, you know, that before was a lot of work on an eight-year-old. What we did was we used the laser to uncover, expose the crown of the tooth, and then the laser was used to perform a, a pulp cap, which results in no bleeding. So you remove that unhealthy pulp there at the top. And this is why we do uh, spec pulpotomies. You want to get rid of that two millimeters of unhealthy pulp that's been exposed to the bacteria. So we got down to healthy pulp, no bleeding. Like I said, exposed the crown. We placed some uh, Brassler uh, BC uh, putty, bioceramic putty. And it's non-staining, so I've kind of moved away from the MTA and the anterior cases. Posterior, I still like MTA. Apicos, I still like it, but um, the Brasser putty works great for these cases. And then we restored the case. So again, been trying to get this uh, young boy back in, but hasn't come in yet. So I assume that, you know, no news is good news there. Multifunctionality treatment. Uh, retreatment here, we got a single visit of... Um, Retreatment again, restored with cases. And I show these as we look at this next case here. So this patient had performed a couple of endos treatments, and then this patient had full mouth rehab done. She came back, and this was about six months after uh, full mouth rehab, beautiful crowns done. And if you'll look there on number nine, little gray spot had, performed, had developed. So the patient had a little gray spot showing through. Obviously, she wasn't happy about that. And uh, so a general dentist called over and wanted me to reaccess through the crown and, and bleach the tooth and, and see what was going on there. And I said, well, I'm not 100% sure that that's going to take care of the problem. We need to figure out, you know, is there, was there a little leakage going on or what? And um, so I, I discussed with the RD and he knew um, I had visited with him prior to that I had a laser and that we had clear, FDA clearance for the removal of for some crowns, all ceramic crowns. Discussed that with this patient here as well. And uh, she was excited about that, about not having a, a, a hole, you know, put in her brand new crown. So let's watch this video here. And we used the uh, YSGG with the MZ10 tip to, what, it, what it's doing is it's going in there and it's breaking that bond, the laser is between the crown interface and the tooth. So the cement bond that's going on there. Now you can only use this on all porcelain crowns, it cannot be on, on metallic crowns, but all porcelain crowns. So you're gonna go um, up and down and kind of cross the tooth, both uh, palatal and buccal. And this is just another, uh, you know, you're not gonna hopefully don't have to do this very often, but 
it's just another nice little tool to have, just another added benefit um, of this. And then I like the uh, Fuji pliers. So I could tell it was starting to get loose. And then you, you grab some emery powder, popped it off. And um, there was a little leakage going on in there. So it looked like maybe a little heme had gotten in there. And that's what it caused the gray. I cleaned it up, re-cemented it. Um, fantastic result. No new crown had to be made. You know, making a single crown on a full mouth um, can be difficult if it's not from the same uh, ingot of porcelain. So win-win uh, for everyone. Great, great. Everyone was super happy. And as we finish up the case reviews here, just another just complex, complex anatomy case. Uh, multiple multiplanar uh, curvatures, dilacerations going on. Uh, pretty large apical finding present. And um, so it's real important on these cases. Um, I don't try to instrument, take my rotary file to full length here. If you do that, then you're just asking for trouble. So we'll, you'll instrument and uh, get a uh, ideal working length. And then you'll use your laser and your laser is going to clean out that apical third of that tooth for you. So you're going to activate with the laser and um, let it do its thing. And then you fill the case and you, you let it heal. So we talked about that prosciutto block earlier. You know, I've done all these cases and, and they look good and patients are feeling good, but I want to know what is really going on inside the tooth. And so I, I visited again with my, my good buddy, Dr. Buchanan, who I know he, he has a lot of interest in irrigation and had did some studies. So, what we did is, is we set this up. We've got two canals going in there, and um, then there's prosciutto in between there. This, this block was sectioned in half and prosciutto put in, and then it was glued back together. So let's take a look at, at what the laser does. And you'll notice the fluid dynamics. So you're going into uh, length minus one millimeter, and just notice that when I'm in one canal, the fluid dynamics that's going in from the other. And I want you to notice there in the coronal portion how that prosciutto is already starting to uh, dissolve just from a short amount of time in there. You're about to see it kind of break apart from the uh, part of it. And I'm going to speed this up here a little bit now. So that wasn't 1x, but we're going to speed it up. And you're just seeing that prosciutto just slowly going away. And I got to think that the prosciutto is uh, a little more resistant than pulp tissue. And I'm going to slow it back down. So this normal speed, I want you to see the, all the cavitation bubbles going on. Just tons of, of fluid dynamics going on everywhere. So speeding it back up again, 4X. Just pulling it out. I mean, See, here's why I think it's important. You can activate it apically. This is the only laser you can do this with. You can activate it apically, get close to it, and then as you withdraw it, you can also activate it in the chamber. So, and when we're activating up the chamber, we're still seeing a lot of fluid dynamics going on, though the, uh, the power um, is not as high as when you're right next to it. So, you kind of have the benefit of both options. Re-irrigate, so you're constantly re-irrigating, re refreshing the hypochlorite. I'm going back to uh, one extra regular speed so you can see the uh, fluid dynamics that's going on again. Just look at all the cavitation bubbles going on there as we slowly withdraw. And once I saw this video, once I did this and, and started seeing this, then I, I was convinced that, you know, this is impressive what's going on. It's safe to use. You have no disruption of your, your procedural flow. You don't have to build any matrices, no platforming, no worrying about leakage. Um, no worrying about hypochlorite accidents. Um, completely safe, and I mean it's multifunctional. You can use it for um, so many other procedures, um, which which helps justify the the expense of it. And again, we're just slowly dissolving this tissue over time here. We're going to speed it back up here again in just a minute. See that piece slowly being dissolved. It's just gradually working its way down from coronal down to the apex to dissolve the uh, prosciutto in this case here, the pulp tissue. You're seeing how the, the larger piece there apically is slowly breaking away from the big chunk um, apical as well, even as we, we pull it up to the coronal portion to the chamber. 
we're still seeing all this fluid dynamic, all this activation going on. So it's really nice to be able to see exactly what's going on from an in vitro standpoint. It helps us understand what's going on when we're in there clinically. And so this has helped me. I've, I've adjusted some of the settings that I personally use from, from what's preset. Um, so I've adjusted the joules and the hertz, and I found a, a, a nice kind of sweet spot that I, that I like, and I think that uh, maximizes the power um, but minimizes some other um, potentials there. So speeding it back up again, as we wrap this up, we're going to see this last little piece uh, disintegrate. I'll speed that up here a little more. As we're getting close to time. So the overall time that, that I was in here was, was around 10 minutes um, of time. And, and that's, uh, I mean, if you do just traditional needle irrigation, you're going to have to put hypochlorite in there in this case and just let it sit for probably a few days. Um, to get that. So you've got the um, activation of the hypochlorite just just speeding the process up on this. And uh, lastly, I, I want to look at, this was a case that I did today. And so I was just finishing up the video, kind of editing of this today. This patient presented symptomatic uh, tooth number 19, um, symptomatic pulpitis. You can see that she's got pretty deep decay underneath that crown. And I just want to show you here a little bit of the, the procedural flow and talk about that, how I do this here. So what we do is we take a pre-op impression of the crown there, and then we re remove the crown. And it's what it looked like. You can see the decay there on the disc, all the tissue that's grown underneath. So if you clean that up, you start touching that with a burr, you know it's just going to start bleeding and just kind of become a mess. And then you're scrubbing viscous fat and, and you know, what other other – um, agents that you have to control bleeding in there and then you're putting a little barrier that way you don't get hypochlorite on it later that would cause bleeding so I don't do any of that anymore we, we clean it up clean the decay up and then this is the um, um, MZ6 tip so we're going to do a gingivectomy and you're going to keep that laser tip about a millimeter from the tissue you don't want it to touch the tissue so it's going to be about a millimeter from the tissue and you're just slowly removing that tissue you're creating a little you know, a little sulcus, a new little sulcus in there, remove that tissue from the, the tooth. That way, when you come to time to restore the case, you just pop a little band in there, or I'll show you what I do on these cases, and it makes it really easy. So it's about a minute here. You know, it's not quite as fast if you use a burr, but um, you don't have the bleeding either. So there's a, a um, expanded function here on the laser, and you're going to do that uh, rapid cut, and that's going to cut rapid, and you're going to follow that up with the um, – um, there's a uh, procedure there, a little setting on it to control the bleeding. And so it basically cauterizes all the vessels. And now you can see there's no bleeding going on um, on the distal there. So um, that's what it looks like there. I've got it access. I've got it cleaned up. I've got the distal cleaned up. And so now we're on our next step. Next step is we need to perform our uh, traditional shaping. And so I'll, I'll quickly show you what I do now for shaping is I determine my length with uh, hand files. I've got my length, and then I'm going in with my rotary. And I just want to show you here what I do. And we've got a solution mixed here, an uh, antibacterial solution mixed. And I, I know my stops on the files. And she go, she's rinsing my files. She's rinsing out the tooth as we go. This is a mixture. It's called uh, Perf Solution. And we're going in there rinsing out. She's cleaning the flutes as I pull the file out. My assistant is. She's in the microscope with me. I know, again, all my links. So it's very, very um, contemporaneous, very on time there. So that's our next step. So we did the gingivectomy and we did our shaping. Now it's time to come in here and do our canal disinfection. So I'll leave the sound on here so you can see. So we've got hypochlorite in the canals now. And the MB and MB, ML canals join on this case. And you're going to see the activation of the I'm in the MB, the activation of the bubbles, the cavitation coming up the ML, is just going to blast all the hypochlorite out of that canal. So the confluency of them forces it out. So we're going to add some more hypo in there. So we're, we're constantly replenishing the hypo. And a lot of times what I do is uh, my assistant in the scope, she'll hold the suction and the hypo at the same time. And she's just replenishing while I'm activating the laser over and over. So, uh, but we did this one a little different while I was trying to record it today. 
Um, but you can see the activation just, I'm in the ML now and it's blowing the hypochlorite up and out the um, MB. We're in the distal, activating the irrigant there. And then we'll come back and we'll do that with uh, EDTA to open the tubules. And then we'll follow that up again with the um, uh, hypochlorite. And so that's what it looks like now. We've got the, the case obturated and cleaned up. And then if you'll look that little light tape there, if you'll look kind of, I've got a mirror shot there and then um, just looking directly through, that's a Teflon tape. And so that sulcus that you've created with the laser, you just want to pack that Teflon tape into the sulcus or you can use cord if you want, but um, you don't have to use any type of matrix now. Just pack that in there and then you'll do your buildup. You can see we've got some apical anatomy present there in the distal root, this vital tooth. Did our buildup, very clean buildup, clean that up. Um, maybe in, this was a little over an hour, right at an hour to treat this case. So everything uh, very efficient, very conservative approach for this case there. So, uh, you know, I appreciate everyone sticking in here towards the end. And, and as we review the laser functions, we can use it for endodontic disinfection, uh, laser assisted disinfection, which that's mainly what we talked about today. Uh, gingivectomy, the multifunctionality of it for that. Um, it's very nice for these uh, deep curious lesions that we often see in the endo practice. Uh, perio endo treatment. So there's a, a randomized controlled trial going on right now uh, looking at um, the use of the uh, laser with their repair protocol versus traditional scaling and root planing. It's a um, multi-office RCT and um, we can probably ask some questions on that later, but that look, that's looking very promising as well for, um, you know, land app or, or repair. But for endo, what I do is I use the um, perio tip to debride that the, if there's a sinus tract, it goes in the sinus tract, cleans that out. A lot of times that sinus tract is epithelial lined, and so you have to remove that sometimes to get that to heal. So you just put the laser in there and you pull it out and it, it uh, takes care of that. Periodontal treatment. Uh, crown removal, it's a nice little tool to have in your back pocket for removal of all porcelain uh, crowns. You know, you didn't get it seated all the way or something, Something you don't have to cut it off, you can use that and, and still use a crown. Um, and then uh, photobiomodulation, that's um, something very nice. Now, the laser that I talked about here, the um, Erbium Chromium YSGG, it's not for photobiomodulation, but they have a diode laser um, that you can use as well that is FDA approved for temporary pain relief. Patients that are clinchers that come in um, with the uh, discomfort of the masseter uh, temporalis, you can use it for treatment of that. So again, um, I'd like to thank everyone for, for listening in. Hope this was beneficial. If you have any questions, you can email me at drmoffin at moffinendo.com. Uh, feel free to follow me at Guided Endo on Instagram. I'll try to be more active on there. And I've got some dynamic navigation cases that you can look at on there as well. And, and we'll start be putting some laser cases on there as well. Um, I will turn it back over to David and he will uh, go through some questions and we'll answer those 